although a bit frazzled and uh, less prepared than I would like to be, uh, I'm very pleased to be back in the Architectural Association and um, also, especially so, uh, in initiating, at least symbolically, uh, what I hope will be a continuing dialogue and interaction between the Architectural Association and the city's program at the London School of Economics, where I've been uh, involved for uh, about four years now. Um, an exciting program that attempts to bring together uh, half a, a group that consists half of trained uh, architects interested in learning about theory and urban research uh, and the social sciences and have social scientists who are committed to learning about design and architecture. And uh, I, I sort of play a, a role as the kind of translator uh, between the two. And of course this, this uh, reverberates probably more with the Architectural Association than any other uh, architecture program uh, in, I think I can say the world now, uh, but certainly in the English-speaking world. I guess uh, my hometown of Los Angeles uh, had our imitation of the Architectural Association in SIOC, the Southern California Institute of Architecture, but it's recently been drained of its leading social, theoretical, urban thinkers, uh, and now is a, a despite its sort of still avant-garde innovativeness within architecture, has, uh, I think, lost that interesting theoretical and social science uh, edge. Uh, we can talk about that later. Um, in a way, I'm doing something radically different from what I've done before, although I think it can adequately be described as something very much uh, that happens here, and that is with architects, and that is a, a very personal discussion of my current thinking and my current projects. Uh, I've never given this lecture before, it's a little bit more personal than I usually give, uh, but it's on a topic that, uh, well, the, the topic that you uh, have seen called Regions on My Mind. Uh, and what I am prepared to do is to give a, a limited number of riffs, if you will, uh, on this topic of regions and regionalism. Uh, why it's very different is that I'm, I'm, I'm not concentrating on what I thought, what I think might be the key issues that would connect between my work and architecture directly, uh, but uh, uh, extending it onto a larger scale, uh, which literally I will be talking about. Uh, I, I had planned to, to show just a few visuals uh, of Chattahuyuk and ancient cities and this wonderful picture of uh, this wall painting, 8,000 year old wall painting, uh, of the city in its region, in its regional context, with a, uh, the first, one of the first cities uh, ever formed. But I've decided not to show the slides uh, and engage only in verbals rather than visuals. Uh, that is, refers to a joke that I periodically tell when I speak to architects uh, about the first time I taught a course jointly with an architect teaching primarily architectural students about urban morphologies, actually, Ricky. Uh, and uh, the, my colleague came in and said, well, I'm an expert on visuals and we'll be having many, many slides and, and overheads and so on to, to illustrate all of the things we're talking about. And I came after him and said, well, what, what can I say? I said, uh, I'm actually a specialist in verbals. And I swear, this actually happened. One architecture student poked the other and said, what do they look like? <laughs> well, so let me, let me move forward. Uh, the argument I'm making is very straightforward and simple. Uh, I think it is uh, important and necessary for architects and urban designers uh, more than ever before uh, to think regionally, to develop an ability to uh, indeed expand the scale of their spatial imaginations, the scale and scope of the way they think about space. Uh, and I think uh, that general argument uh, is going to be 
concretized within arguments about regions on my mind. First, uh, I am a regionalist. Uh, what this means, that ist at the end, means that I am interested in promoting uh, and uh, the concept of region and regional thinking uh, as useful across a whole range of subjects. I have written down here a whole range of subjects from architecture to revolution, to rephrase Corbusier's you know, narrow binary choice. Um, that was meant to be a, an expression of the, 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 the wide range to which the regional concept uh, can be applied. I say I'm a regionalist because I was uh, uh, educated as such, uh, and I've been uh, a regionalist for at least, I guess it's awful, 40 years, but perhaps I can even say longer because I think probably I was 9 or 10 when I decided to become a geographer, and in many ways uh, every geographer, uh, every good geographer is uh, a regionalist, a regional thinker. So I might qualify my first statement by saying I'm not just a regionalist, but in particular I'm a regionalist geographer. Uh, this is the area of my training, uh, and because of my age I actually uh, was trained in some relatively traditional forms of geography where the concept of region was maybe the central organizing concept of the entire discipline. Um, the concept of region at that time was a, a kind of inter integrative concept, to again rephrase a, 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 a phrase that I've used before, everything seemed to come together in regions. There was a, a, a debate about a concept of campage as a specialized regional concept where you can have physical geography and human geography integrated. Uh, there were several famous geographical traditions that uh, focused around some concept of region. Uh, the one I was trained in uh, was uh, under uh, political geographers like Richard Hartshorn at the University of Wisconsin, uh, the, the author of a famous book in the 30s called The Nature of Geography. Uh, and he sort of saw geography as a study of uh, aerial differentiation and aerial covariation. What this mean, meant at that time, or to use contemporary words, was that everything on Earth was geographically unevenly developed. And certain patterns were associated with other patterns. And they came together in, in sort of different regions. Uh, the regions were organized around uh, this integral notion uh, uh, of human relationships to the environment. Uh, a different tradition was the French tradition of regional geography, which is very rich and influential, uh, led by this key figure of Vidal de la Blache. And so we were taught about genre de vie, uh, about lifestyles, uh, life worlds, um, that uh, ways of living, uh, in this case primarily rural but also urban, uh, and again, with a strong regional concept uh, underpinning uh, these ideas. Even this other tradition uh, of uh, Karl Sauer and cultural geography also was rooted in notions of regions and cultural regions and their formation and, and, and what instigated the formation of these cultural regions and how they interrelated with others and indeed to some extent changed uh, over time. So, uh, uh, this is one qualification, that I am a regionalist geographer. And uh, uh, out of this I have a little uh, sort of a thesis or argument. Uh, and that is uh, that regionalists, those who are consciously and specifically regionalist geographers, have tended to be at the forefront of spatial or geographical theory building and theorizing um, for most of the century. Uh, the leading theorists of the, whatever they are, 50s and 60s in geography were 
uh, political geographers who were also focused on regional thinking. Uh, and I think uh, the spatial theory ever since into the new geography uh, has also, although much less explicitly, uh, been uh, rooted in regional concepts in geography. Uh, that this twinning of regional and spatial thinking, or regional thinking as a, as a central form of spatial thinking, uh, has continued for, uh, to the present. I say uh, not explicitly because in many ways regional geography today is looked upon by most of the new geographers as some fuddy-duddy old concept. Uh, and that uh, regional geography is attached to the old geography. But in many ways, this is uh, this, the, the, the continued importance of regionalism and regional thinking uh, it has been buried. And, and I don't have any problems with describing all of my work, from my early work on um, modernization processes in uh, Africa, uh, to all of my work on Los Angeles uh, in describing these as critical regional geographies. Right? Um, this is perhaps another way uh, of describing my identity in this first package of uh, concepts or ideas or descriptions that I'll be uh, discussing. On top of being a critical regionalist geographer, I guess my full identity would be uh, completed by the addition of planning. Uh, that I am a I'm a critical regionalist geographer dash planner. Uh, planning is added on last, uh, but I've been teaching planning and uh, paid by a planning department for the last uh, 30 years. Uh, so, not by a geography department, which has given me, by the way, a, a lot of interesting freedoms. Uh, and uh, planning is a peculiar field. Uh, uh, I, don't, I guess it's similar uh, in Britain as it is to the United States. And in, in a way, there are three separate worlds of planning. Uh, there's sort of local community planning uh, 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 at a neighborhood scale, uh, which gets attached very much to questions of urban design uh, in terms of, of you know, bunches of building and, 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 and related issues at a local scale. Uh, then there's a kind of broader notion of urban planning, uh, which uh, traditionally and historically has also been spun off in part from architecture, but the spin in most of the United States and some of England, uh, Britain, uh, has been so intense that it uh, has disconnected itself largely from those old architectural roots, which were dragging it down to the first local scale, by the way. Uh, and the uh, urban uh, planning uh, directions have moved towards the social sciences, uh, and indeed a little bit closer to geography. Um, uh, in Britain, I think part of this is blocked by this outrageously stupid term that persists called town planning. It, it, you know, if there was something I'd like to sort of just erase from the vocabulary of academic uh, and professional discussion in the United States is that word town in there because it, it really confuses everything. Uh, and uh, particularly with regard to the kinds of things I'm arguing here about expanding the scale of the architectural mind. Um, and the third world of planning has been regional planning, very separate. Uh, historically from uh, the other two, uh, uh, absolutely having no architectural roots to it. Uh, that's why I'm sometimes a little uncomfortable talking about regions in an architectural school because the, traditionally uh, the connection has been uh, almost non-existent. Uh, and indeed, uh, regional planning has had different roots from urban and local planning. Uh, uh, in that it has been deeply related to geography. If you see a planning department almost anywhere in the world, like the one at the LSE, uh, which calls itself a department of regional and urban planning, uh, then you know it's tightly tied to a geography department. Right? If it says urban and regional uh, planning, 
you don't know. If it's just town planning and regional planning, then you know it's not connected at all to geography. Right? Uh, sort of interesting language play here, reflecting these traditions. I, I have been teaching 30 years uh, at UCLA, which has been one of the most geographically minded departments of planning in the United States. In Britain, in Canada, and Australia, geography and planning are, are fairly closely tied. Uh, in the United States, uh, almost uh, none of the major departments are really very closely tied with geography departments uh, and uh, not, even, not attached to them at all. But UCLA used to be a very geographical department, and I've been working on theoretical issues for the last 20, 30 years as well. Yet I could not teach planning theory because my interests, which have been in regional planning, uh, were, were not considered the mainstream of planning or urban planning. It was sort of leaning too far to geography, even though the leading planning theorist at UCLA, John Friedman, was himself a regional planner, trained in part in geography. But the concept of planning uh, always peripheralized regional planning and in some ways didn't quite know how to, uh, what to do with it. Uh, in, in our, as I say, what I've been doing has been teaching regional planning uh, all my time uh, at UCLA. Um, and uh, one of the arguments I've been making, I'm just trying to see my notes, which are getting a little blurry. I think I had too much uh, cider before. Um, one of my notes here is that one of, the, one of the points I usually make with regional planning, to talk a little bit more about the nature of regional planning, is that regional planning is always a little bit subversive. Maybe because it's been peripheralized in the planning establishment in mainstream planning. But it's also, by its very nature, uh, a uh, concept of planning that is actually looking to create new forms of planning against the grain of established forms of governance and policy making. So regional planning in, in any country is, is trying to move between to find new ways of planning that exist between the nation-state level, the centralized or federalized nation-state level, uh, and uh, the urban level, uh, something in between, usually not existing uh, at that time, urging that we need to uh, rethink the whole territorial structure of governance uh, and policy formation to uh, create new tiers. Uh, at the metropolitan scale sometimes, at, at uh, uh, a sub-national regional scale at other times, uh, and we'll come back to this in a moment, sometimes at uh, even higher than the nation-state scales. Uh, okay, so, so this begins uh, uh, my second riff, uh, having to do with just trying to uh, uh, identify what uh, is regional thinking, what are its uh, most important uh, aspects. What, what really defines what I'm talking about here as regional thinking? Well, first, I think, uh, is uh, the notion of the region as an integrative concept, again. Uh, the place where it all comes together. Uh, that, uh, or, or, or virtually everything, that, that regions can be seen as fundamental formations or units of human society. That regions, uh, as one sort of expounds upon their importance, uh, can even be seen as sort of equivalent in importance to other social formations that we take for granted as vital uh, to understanding human society. Uh, one being sort of kinship and ethnicity, uh, that we form our identities uh, and, and social collectives in part around either real or presumed blood relations. Uh, and this creates ethnic identities and often national identities and so on. Uh, the other obvious powerful force on our lives has to do with questions of production, consumption, exchange, and markets. The market operates uh, now in every part of the world uh, as an important organizational force in society. 
uh, and it has its own special dynamics, as does uh, the kind of culture formation notion that we talk about with ethnicity, race, uh, uh, and kinship. <coughs> Uh, and, of course, the other third uh, notion is the, the polity or the state, the, the political organization of society. Uh, these are the three that are usually given most prominence, particularly in social theory and social thought. Uh, but the regionalist is arguing that uh, the regional formation of human society uh, is equally important, needs to be given uh, uh, due attention uh, as a fundamental integrative force, uh, a force for human identity, behavior, activity, uh, attachment uh, as uh, the market, the state, uh, and various kinship links. So this is one uh, part of regionalism, a, a kind of fostering and promotion of the importance of the regional concept. Uh, and, and this, although not all regionalists uh, make such uh, bold kinds of assertions about regions, uh, this is where uh, the regional analyst, the regionalist, uh, is indeed heading. This, a second aspect here is that this is an integral part of human spatiality. As I said before, this broad notion of space uh, includes within it uh, this notion of region and regionalism and regional social formations, uh, if you wish. Um, this links regionalism to a number of maybe sometimes more familiar concepts uh, having to do with human spatiality. Placemaking uh, and attachment to place uh, is very similar to what we might call region making uh, and attachment to regions. These are similar sometimes uh, some cultural geographers even conflate this, under place. All right? You want to talk about regions, well, regions are places. Uh, I sort of almost reverse that kind of uh, priority and put regions first, if you will. Regions are particularly also uh, linked to concepts of territorial behavior, or territoriality. Uh, and uh, this is particularly important. Uh, the, the, the definition, the roots, the etymological roots of region uh, has to do with, uh, with the, the Latin regere, uh, to rule, right? uh, to govern. Uh, it's a kind of governed space. And territoriality has to do with particular kinds of behaviors of marking, bounding, defending spaces. And this often weaves into the concept of regions. So too is this notion of uneven development, and so too is the notion that I developed centrally in, uh, in post-metropolis, the, the, the recent book I've written, uh, called uh, Cynicism, the Stimulus of Urban Agglomeration. Regions and regionalism are intimately linked to cities, to urbanism, to urban agglomeration. What I mean by cynicism is the stimulus of urban agglomeration, what happens when people move together to live on, under one roof, uh, and the dynamics that emerge from this. And one of the dynamics that emerge from this is the construction of urban regions. Uh, regional doesn't mean that we switch off the urban, uh, even though those two worlds of planning often disconnect them. Regions mean that you're intimately connected with uh, uh, cities and with uh, urban formations. Morrison asked me before, before what, what did RID stand for in my uh, brief biography that he read. Uh, and it stands for the area that I teach in at UCLA called regional and international development. It used to be called urban and regional development. Uh, but we changed it because we wanted to put the regions first, but without uh, disregarding the urban. So. Uh, if we put the urban first, the urban took over, so now we took the regional first, but we try to maintain this central focus on city regions, on urban regions, and urban regional development. Well, all this, and then, then the third, of, uh, and, and, and really maybe the most difficult and challenging, uh, is that regional thinking is deeply involved in the thinking about the scale of human society, the multiple scales within which we live. Uh, this is maybe the most 
important and interesting aspect of regional thinking in that it is the area that is specialized more than anywhere else in an understanding of the interrelationships between different scales. I would say from the local to the global, but I really would like to say that there are many more in between that often get completely neglected. Uh, it's this interscalar thinking that's vital uh, to uh, regional thinking. The, um, the, uh, the principle that derives from all three integrative concept notions that link to broader notions of space and territory and this vital element of scale uh, is what I think of as the most basic principle of uh, the, the, the spatial dimensions of human life. Uh, it's what I think should be taught in primary schools as the starting point for teaching uh, about space and geography uh, in the schools. And it's a simple notion, uh, yet it's almost completely forgotten uh, in our conscious thought and in the academic literature, particularly in the social sciences uh, and in social theory. And that is, we all live in a multi-layered hierarchy of nodal regions right? that starts from our body, the, the basic unit. Ego is the center of a set of regions, of personal space of, uh, as well as spaces on much larger scales that we live in. And architects recognize that interface between body and building space and occasionally also with body and neighborhood space, and even occasionally with bodies in movement through the city. Uh, but what's happened here is that there are these whole series of nested layers of scale within which we live, and all of these scales have a certain quality about them. That quality is in that word nodal. They all tend to focus around at least one point, one center, uh, one city, one body, you know, one ego, one neighborhood, whatever. All of these tend to have this particular kind of regional organization. And that's the starting point uh, for what we need to do, and that is to understand the dynamics of how these are formed, how they change, uh, what meaning they have on behavior, how they can be modified how they might shape design, how they are shaped by design, uh, all kinds of issues uh, uh, having to do with markets, with the state, uh, with culture and kinship relationships, and all together with regions. Right, that's the end of riff number two, uh, and I think I'm going to have to uh, go quickly. Riff number three is uh, uh, an argument about what we can call now the new regionalism. There has been a resurgence of interest in regions over the last 20 years, but particularly over the last five or six years. Uh, that is really unparalleled and unprecedented in the past 150 to 200 years uh, of thinking anywhere, everywhere. Right? Everywhere there has been an extraordinary expansion of thinking about regions. In many ways, it's piggybacked on a similar expansion of thinking about cities. Uh, but all of both of those based upon what I sometimes call the spatial turn uh, that has been transforming or at least diffusing into nearly every discipline, way beyond what I call the spatial disciplines, architecture being one, geography being another, urbanism and urban studies being a, a third. These are the traditional core spatial disciplines. Uh, in a way, they've almost been, I don't want to make too strong an argument here, almost left behind by an extraordinary sort of transdisciplinary diffusion into almost every subject. In the humanities, even in the, uh, redoing this in the social sciences, uh, with it maybe the exception of sociology, but that's another lecture. Uh, there's some very interesting, uh, uh, the latest thing I get uh, to illustrate how far this spatialization of thinking has extended is uh, uh, a letter from a person, I guess it was the University of Edinburgh, who was telling me that they were engaged in a, a complete rethinking of their field, a spatial rethinking of their entire discipline. And the discipline was accounting. Right? I don't know where it's coming from or going to, but, but uh, the, the extent is extraordinary. 
you all know about, theatre studies, film studies, communication studies, uh, literature, English literature, critical, uh, um, cultural studies, and so on, post-colonial studies, all of these are, are experiencing uh, this uh, renewed attention to uh, space, to space, and also, I would argue, piggybacking on that, uh, a, a new regionalism uh, becoming more and more prominent uh, in, across many, many disciplines. Why this is occurring, I mean, some of these are familiar, but uh, globalization uh, forces are one, the uh, economic restructuring, creating the new economy uh, is another, the information technology re uh, revolution, that spatial turn itself, what I call in the post-metropolis the, the kind of transformation of cities, the new urbanization, I can't say new urbanism, that's been taken over and copyrighted by someone else, uh, uh, and, and, and sort of all of these forces really creating a kind of resurgence of importance in the regional concept and in regional thinking and in regionalism uh, and in regional political kinds of questions. Uh, the the, uh, the, the int most interesting process, if I had time, I would discuss this in a little bit more detail as the foundation of this new regionalism is a process that in the literature gets given this lengthy name of deterritorialization and re-territorialization, a very interesting set of, of dual concepts working, not so du not, well, two co interrelated, let's call them dialectical concepts, uh, that are reshaping our territorial identities and the scales in which we live. Restructuring, not eliminating them, uh, but changing the imp relative importance of all of the scales we live in. Prior to this uh, current period, uh, the nation state has been a powerfully dominating territorial scale in our lives. What's been happening in recent years, as you, you all are familiar with, is a kind of debate that the, the sovereignty and relative power of the nation state has been changing. And this has stimulated new levels of empowerment on a both cultural and, and political and, and, well not both, but cultural, political and, and economic level. Uh, and so we have uh, a, a, a powerful tendency towards supranational regionalism, big trading blocks, and uh, the European Union itself is one of the primary <coughs> examples of this, and I'll get back to this in a moment, uh, but NAFTA and Mercosur and all, uh, all kinds of regional trading blocks above the nation state level beginning to get become more and more important. The European Union perhaps as, uh, has gone as, as far as any but also subnational regionalisms uh, have increased in importance. Uh, in Quebec, in Lombardy, well, I mean, the examples abound all over the world, where in, over the last 30 years you've seen a resurgence of political and cultural regionalisms. Uh, again, uh, I'll get back to that when I talk about uh, the next one, uh, which I will do very briefly. Uh, that, that what's happening, and it's also happening at the local scale, we're having a rethinking of of uh, local governance, of city government, of regional governance, metropolitan governance, caused by these changes operating at multiple scales. Frequently, those who analyze an individual scale, like the changing role of the state, producing these silly books like The End of the Nation State, and all of that, or uh, even the regional scale, or looking at the European Union as a supranational unit, they frequently fail to look at these interscalar issues, which I think are so central to regional thinking. Okay, so this brings us to number four, uh, and uh, I will do uh, a very brief uh, look at this, uh, and that has to do with uh, the, the, the European case. Uh, the formation of the European Union has been described as creating a Europe of the regions Never before uh, this kind of attempt at supranational integration have these, well, not never before, uh, in, in the mid-19th century and late 19th century, regionalism was a powerful force that was you know, fought by emerging nation states to erase regional differences and create national, integrated national markets. Today we're seeing many of those 19th century regionalisms and others uh, reasserting themselves 
uh, particularly in Europe. And even those that aren't reasserting themselves are being incorporated within uh, a whole series of economic policies of the European Union led by this regional fund, uh, indicative of the powerful regional thinking that exists at least across the, Red sea, the North Sea, not the Red Sea, but the North Sea uh, on the continent. We'll come back to Britain uh, in a moment. Uh, I am um, currently, oh, I'm sorry, before I get to this, uh, the best illustration of this is this extraordinary concept, which is almost invisible in Britain, uh, almost invisible, uh, at least, and when it is, is recognized, is almost completely misunderstood. Uh, and that is this notion that has evolved called the European, the words are extraordinary, the European Spatial Development Perspective. You know, those forget about the European part per se, but those three words, spatial development perspective, would never have been put together 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It just, would, I, it just wouldn't happen. Right? Uh, but with what's been happening over the last five to 10 years, suddenly this is not only uh, emerging, but is now uh, an accepted part uh, or recognized part of uh, European fundamental economic, social, and cultural policy. Uh, and with its uh, connection to questions of exclusion and inequality and justice uh, and other social, for, social issues that, that used to be connected, uh, disconnected uh, from the regional, are now being embedded in a spatial regional perspective. Not that it's had much impact, not that it's some sort of glorious thing that's happening, uh, but as I said, the, in, the, just the very existence of it is uh, a significant uh, illustration uh, of this new regionalism. Uh, if I had more time, I, I, I would uh, spend it on discussing what I'm doing right now. I've been uh, in a very exciting project for me, asked by uh, a, a group called Barcelona Regional. Uh, Ricky is involved in part with some of the architectural aspects of this, but led by a remarkable character called uh, Joseph Asabio, who is the impresario for many of the developments, uh, particularly in the uh, Olympic changes taking place in Barcelona, has now become a new regionalist. Uh, it's possible for an architect, an urban designer of international renown, to actually recognize this uh, new regionalism and he's asked me, he said, come over. I've read your book, Post Metropolis, and he said, I've read your other books as well. Come over and give us some advice on how to regionalize Catalonia. Right? Um, he, it's called Barcelona Regional, but when I was there, I was telling him that I think it should be called Catalonia Regional because Barcelona was going to dominate too much, symbolically. And while I was there, his boss called him up and said, you know, by the way, I think you should change it from Barcelona to Catalonia Regional. So I, I've been very successful, at least at that point. But it's an exciting challenge to sort of bring these into new guidelines. Uh, London, Britain, ah, dear. Uh, there's uh, British regionalism. Well, there was a, a, a little spark, maybe the most important thing that Blair has done since, uh, since New Labour came to office. The process of devolution was at least a reflection of this new regionalism. Uh, I even thought that Blair might even be aware of it, but uh, all evidence subsequently suggests that he hasn't. Uh, the British political uh, uh, order hasn't recognized this very much. Uh, and certainly the British left uh, has also not recognized. I mean, nobody uh, is significantly understanding this new regionalism and its challenge uh, that it's presenting. Uh, the, the, um, uh, there is this effort uh, at what is called the London Plan, towards the London Plan, initial proposals for the mayor's spatial development strategy. So even Livingston seems to at least have some of the words. He's reduced it away from perspective and used the word strategy because it fit into his strategist's language, uh, which is very unspatial. Uh, in fact, there's another side argument that I've made in a lot of my work, uh, too, that uh, Britain and the British intellectual tradition has been more blatantly historicist and anti-spatially historicist 
than most continental, close to the Germans, but certainly as far away as possible from the French and the Italian and, and other European traditions, uh, in that they just don't get space very easily. Uh, they don't understand region, regional thinking very easily. And it's partly as a result of this, and I make no blame whatsoever here, that the spatial thinking uh, is being dominated on the one side by totally aspatial thinkers, and on the other side by architects and urban designers moving into the vacuum created by this weird disappearance or absence of a regional thinking uh, in Britain. Uh, and so we have uh, uh, regional thinking uh, becoming extraordinarily uh, limited and, and having almost no contact with the dynamic and interesting developments taking place on the continent uh, in particular. Uh, and uh, in part, uh, this is one of the uh, aims of this lecture to start encouraging the architects who are indeed playing a role and, and in some cases doing as well as they possibly can uh, wi within the range and scope uh, of traditional forms of architecture, not even traditional, but new and better forms of architecture and urban design. Uh, but what I would like to do is just at least increase this awareness and consciousness of this larger scale perspective. Finally, uh, is what Moisten thought I was going to talk about uh, for the core of this, uh, and I'm just going to end with it uh, as a, a very important uh, part of the story. Uh, and that is the emergence of new concepts uh, such as this notion of regional democracy. That the debates, debates on democracy, on citizenship, and on justice over the last several years are also becoming significantly spatialized and regionalized. Uh, this is not something, although when I started writing about this, I thought I might have been a little bit alone in, in what's happening. Uh, over the last two or three years, some remarkable developments have taken place. There has emerged, for example, in the United States, in a few parts of the United States, something very interesting for planners, something that's called community-based regionalism. The first time that I can think of knowing the history of planning, community groups are thinking regionally, strategically, and politically in the United States, saying that community development cannot operate in our traditional cells. All right, there's this community fighting, competing with this community to have developments or new developments and so on. It could only occur at a coordinated regional scale, but a new kind of regional scale. Right? So this is one of these very interesting developments coming out of a, a kind of regionalization of our thoughts about democracy and global cities, because my term, uh, my preferred term is global city regions. Uh, this is what the majority of the world's population live in today. And within these global uh, uh, city regions, there are massive new challenges coming up, particularly around community-based regional pla planning and regional development. The whole notion of new forms of regional government to fit these post-metropolises that are emerging, these huge global city regions, that this form of governance has to adapt to the new regionalism, which makes regions increasingly the motors of the global economy, uh, increasing in comparison to the nation state, becoming the centers, the innovative centers of this new globalized economy. But we need to sort of maintain these competitive regional edges, but at the same time dealing with another aspect of globalization and economic restructuring that is often forgotten about, and that is all of these changes over the last 30 years have, have manufactured new forms and intensified for old forms of inequality. We are living in a, uh, what I call a fractal city with multiple axes of inequality intensifying every day. Uh, the, 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 the UN reported after the, the, uh, Ameri the LA riots in 92 that this was part or the beginning of a part of an urban revolution taking place on every continent. Uh, in the world, an urban revolution that's associated, among many other things, with deepening poverty and a widening gap between the wealthy and the poor. And so the, the great challenge of regional governance, because it's, uh, the, the nation state is getting weaker uh, and, and the local is reasserting, but often in competitive multiple forms, you know, we have an infinite millions of locals 
Uh, what we need is to find ways of coordinating this, new ways of coordinating this that don't fit under current governmental structures, or typically don't. It's related to new forms and new thinking about citizenship. Uh, that w what's happening with the weakening of the nation state to some extent uh, is a kind of beginnings of, of a reversion back to urban, regional, residential rights. Uh, Lefebvre used to call, uh, call this uh, rights to the city. Uh, what is happening now is called rights to the city region, to the resources of the city region in which you live. Uh, I, will, I will close with this final example, which I've been closing most of my, my lectures with recently. Uh, it, it's not as dramatic as, as I try to make it sometimes, but uh, uh, there was a recent event in Los Angeles indicative of the fact that Los Angeles is probably the peak point of inequality of any city in the developed world. L LA and New York uh, have the most intensified inequalities over these past 30, 30 years. But also, because of these extreme conditions, it may be one of the places where new ideas are going to come out most significantly. And one of these very interesting things happened is something called the Bus Riders Union, uh, a kind of a coalition, because all of this is built on peculiar coalitions. In this case, a kind of coalition primarily of the immigrant working poor who are transit dependent. Uh, that is, they, they are dependent on public transit. And what they did was to sue the uh, uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority, who had a huge plan for rail uh, underground development, uh, a fixed rail system in Los Angeles, and argued that it was not only racially unjust, in that it favored whites over non-whites for the most part, uh, discriminated against the work immigrant working poor, but that it was spatially unjust. It was geographically unjust. The plan for a network of trains could be analyzed as a plan as being spatially unjust, favoring, in this case very simply, a kind of suburban, white, wealthy population to the primary core of this uh, uh, working poor population in the inner city. And they won. And billions of dollars are now shifting away from fixed rail into improving the bus system, which is uh, the, the, the transit that, is, that the population is most dependent on. A massive, at least capital shift, if you want, or expenditure shift in public policy uh, linked to the rising of a kind of community, labor-based coalitions fighting for their rights to the city region. Uh, they are becoming regionalists too. Thank you. How shall we do it? I think maybe we could just sit there. Let's take this. Uh, I'm not going to be able to sit on the screen. Do you want to Could I just ask you to settle down a little bit? If anybody wants to leave, could you do that quickly? And so we could start. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe start by asking Ricky to see if you have any uh, more general comments, response to, uh, to Ed's presentation, um, or to uh, raise some questions, I think, in, in relation to, uh, to Ed's comments. Well, let me start by you know, saying how whatever one says or whatever I say anyway from, uh, in relation to Ed's breadth of uh, understanding of, of uh, the urban and the architectural problem is extremely small and uh, 
uh, nearly by definition of my profession of what I'm involved in. Uh, but certainly the engagement with him and others at the LSE and sort of, as you call it, widening the, the debate or widening the perspective uh, is important. But nonetheless, I think there are still some issues which we continue uh, discussing and would like to take forward in a way today. Um, and that is very much to do with, you know, does space matter uh, <coughs> ultimately within the web of uh, bigger issues and the regional dimensions that you talked about. But before asking such a naive and stupid question, what I've realized by spending now four years at the London School of Economics is that what we guys think of as space on the whole is incredibly different from what, I'm not saying you guys, because that is the one exception in many ways in, in the sort of the world of geography and planning, but certainly what most of the professional uh, planners and geographers considered space. And one of the things I'd like to ask Ed in a way to amplifies to whether you would agree with me, and to a degree even some of your work, and particularly postmodern geography, uh, tends to consider the, sp the word space, or certainly the, wor the adjective spatial, as meaning much more locational. In other words, where it happens within that complex, which may be a city or maybe a region, as to what it is like within uh, a sort of mass of spaces, streets, and places. Um, so first, I, in a way, I'd like to, to um, ask you to respond to that, because when you talk so convincingly about the spatial turn, which I think is, I mean, a, a fundamental point that Ed has been able to identify in all the disciplines that one is touching upon, whether it's literature uh, or politics or, uh, and, and many others, where the, the notion of the word space is actually much more integrated. <coughs> Oddly, in planning, I think it's been completely sort of left out. So I'd like to hear maybe add a, a bit more about that. Leading then to the obvious question, which you and I um, maybe discuss, as to whether if there is this distinction of um, definitions between spatial versus locational, does space as meant the design of streets and squares matter at all? Uh, and can you design a sequence of spaces or projects uh, which somehow either are uh, part of and allow the regional processes to actually happen or, as I am becoming more convinced, actually hinder certain processes from happening? So that when you ended rightly with this extraordinary story of sort of uh, spatial injustice or injustice of a transit system, uh, I mean, I'm equally convinced that you can create areas of spatial injustice in the new housing communities we're developing in East London, which I think we, we are. And is that worthy of sort of investigation, and how does it link into the wider regional and global issues? Great. Um, on the first, first broad question, when you were asking me about uh, my particular way of looking at space, um, you, know, you, you mentioned the word location, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's location, but more that other word that you used uh, in this, and that is context. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what, uh, well, this is where uh, I differ from um, other spatial thinkers, uh, mm -hmm. and especially architects, mm -hmm. and is vitally related to this notion of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the particular area I would love to focus on uh, in the studios would be how you, how the, how you te contextualize your projects. Because contextuality for me is indeed that general principle I talked to you before. A building is located in a nested hierarchy of nodal regi regions extending from its skin and body to the globe. Mm -hmm. And potentially, it's going to be affected by, and perhaps even shape, many of those nested regions. Uh, and so contextualizing uh, is not just saying, well, what's in the immediate neighborhood? Uh, or you know, what is happening because uh, of globalization? Um, you know, this, this kind of contextualization is, is not enough. Uh, and so what I'm really doing is really redefining the notion of, notion of context. 
The other thing I'm doing with context, which you know, is a, is a way, another way of basically talking about human spatiality. Mm -hmm. right? that, that context as fundamentally human spatiality. And this is the other departure uh, and difficulty uh, in terms of engaging, not just with architects, with other geographers and other spatial thinkers, is the notion that context is simultaneously form and process, mm. that mm. this is not just a description of context as multiple regions of form, or, or, or multiple regions that have a, a, a kind of concrete geography to them. Uh, but is also this active process of producing those regions. And this is a vital part of architectural thinking, I think, in terms of what I'm arguing for, mm. is that architects must be aware that what they're doing may be affecting such things as regional democracy, spatial justice, gender domination, mm. Uh, you know, all kinds of forms of uh, economic exploitation. Uh, it's not a matter, you know, I frequently, when I talk to architects about this, uh, the answer is a, is a very reasonable one. You know, if I begin to think about all of those things, I'll never be able to design. Right? I'll, I'll, just be, I'll just be paralyzed by, by all of the complexity. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, I guess sometimes my response is, but maybe that's better. Hmm. Uh, but uh, it, it's re it, you know, regional thinking brings about this kind of awareness, uh, and so that's that's uh, in a sense I've now you know moved into the second question, uh, uh, which is you know I, I, I I'm sure that uh, it was a kind of feel I know. I'm sorry to tell that little story, but when I first started talking to architects, my very first lecture was at Harvard in the School of Design. Somebody asked, I, I asked somebody who taught there, what should I expect? And they responded by saying, oh, well, they'll listen to me, listen to me as if I were a, a kind of animal in a zoo. Right? And if I ranted and roared, they'd like it and smile and be entertained and listen to me. And they'd listen and see and watch, is there anything that could immediately be used? Where can I poach? Is there anything to poach into my design process, into my design project tomorrow? If there's nothing there, mm, I was entertained, goodbye. Hmm. Um, and, and, and this is a problem because I was about my lecture today because I, I didn't make any effort really to get into the design process. But in essence, I, I am saying that, that regional thinking uh, should affect design. Right? Not in every case. But you should be aware as architects that you are shaping space. You are producing spaces. You are participants in the social production of space. Your specialty seems to be focused upon a micro scale. Uh, mine tends to be on a macro scale, but I try my best to communicate with the micro spatial thinkers. Uh, we'll get into another story about my work on Amsterdam. Uh, I can be a flaneur, I can even talk design if I want to. I try to make that connection. Sometimes not very well. Uh, but uh, uh, the same thing should be true the other way, that the micro-specialists should be more and more aware of the macro-processes that are shaping what you're doing. And absolutely, uh, the organization of space, the production of space, the social formation of spaces from the body, uh, what you do with your body and with your buildings, to the global scale, can be organized for the good and can be organized for the bad. It can be a form of oppression, it can be a form of resistance. Uh, you know, it, it is this, this variation uh, that really is uh, the vital part of this kind of consciousness because you have to be aware that you could be doing something socially positive and socially or socially negative uh, with your designs, that the range is there, it's available to you. Uh, and you're not going to necessarily be able to switch to maximum social good, but you might be able to move a little bit away from bad right? in terms of social impact. Example? Um, well, I guess the way you've design, been involved designing in. housing, I guess, t today some of the, the uh, uh, mass housing developments, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, I was 
participant in, in again in the architectural foundation uh, uh, competition on um, uh, new models for uh, affordable housing mm -hmm. uh, uh, on a mass level and I think you know this commitment of architectural creativity is of vital importance right? that that architects uh, you know, focus upon uh, um, uh, focus attention on some of these larger social issues particularly in London mm -hmm. uh, where there seems to be uh, for good reason a ma and, and I think the design to, to promote a design that's uh, relatively inexpensive but maximally attractive utilizes space in the most creative and efficient way responds to social conditions which has to do with the elimination, I mean, the almost uh, the, the reduction in the numbers of nuclear families uh, of the traditional sense and the massive multiplication of uh, single uh, person families or small uh, single person households and so on. Uh, the, the recognition that there is in many cities uh, an extraordinarily invisible housing crisis of, uh, of massive proportions. Well, in London, it's sort of recognized that, oh, yes, people who do vital services can't afford to live in London. And that's sort of being recognized. But this has to be pushed and understood in terms of what causes it, why is it happening, uh, and, and how can architects contribute somewhat through design. As, by the way, I, I don't think there is necessarily uh, uh, an enormous amount that architects can contribute to resolving the problems, or if you want geographers perhaps too, uh, although I think I would like to, to put more emphasis on regional uh, mm -hmm. issues. But can, I, mean, I've, I mean, I've seen you, I think, writhing with anger when uh, <laughs> uh, an ennobled architect, won't be difficult to work out which of the two, um, <laughs> made this argument at a public lecture for high density housing <coughs> in every possible brownfield site in London in order to resolve, in a way, the, the needs that you've just Describe because I think you felt that in many ways this sort of notion of putting everything everywhere, um, this sort of and trying to resolve it through some form of well-designed form of be of Bedford Square, say, yeah. uh, you found naive beyond belief. I think you're being. Um, t tell us why you find that so naive. Well, multiple levels. It's, it's, uh, partly with a caution because uh, this person, which is Richard Rogers. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think is 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 uh, better than 95 percent of the alternative choices, right? Uh, so that tempers it. But yes, I was uh, uh, upset at this. One is, as you said, the the abs absence of a kind of locational no, no. sensitivity uh, that it matters where you put this housing much more than he seemed to even think. Then there was the all eggs in one design basket mm -hmm. uh, or architectural basket. That is, the, all of the problems, I mean, he was given, as I said before, because of a vacuum of spatial and regional mm -hmm. thinking, he was sucked in. This is relatively fortunate, better him mm -hmm. than 95% of the others, but he was sucked in as an architect to deal with London's problems, conceptualizing the future of London, uh, of the London region. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and what he did was to put all his eggs in a narrow design basket because the scope of thinking was so limited. It was not just location. It was, the, again, that vital notion of the scale of thinking is so confined. And thirdly is sort of the classic problem uh, and the real great difference uh, uh, between uh, geographical regional thinkers uh, and uh, uh, urban architectural thinkers um, uh, has to do with this issue of scale. In terms of urban, m much of urban design, and I see this not just in, in traditional practices in architecture, but also in fancy things like spatial syntax. Uh, the city is considered to be a kind of bunch of these small spaces. Right? You, 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 you can't think very much beyond those small spaces. So when you think of the city and the region, all it is is agglomerations of these little spaces, right? Uh, and, and that becomes the city. Uh, that gets taught, I understand, in traditional uh, uh, morphology classes, uh, urban morphology classes. Uh, 
and I, I never understand this, what do they call topologies, uh, typologies? And what they're talking about is Frank Lloyd Wright, open this Corbusier, big building. And he's all about, uh, and this is called urban form, uh, open, closed, and it's all having to do with small scale regions. Uh, and this is useful, it ha it's, it's, it's important for doing good urban design, but it's not the way in which you conceive of the city and the global city region. Mm -hmm. right? And because of that absence of thinking, Poor Ken Livingston and his unimaginative advisors become obsessed by what? That's one of them. Globalization. <laughs> Globalization and the city. You know, the city dominates London, that's it. So we must preserve the city of London. Right? Now, the city of London has been, you know, a, a factor in uneven and exploitative regional development in Britain for 250 years. Uh, it, it's linked to the deindustrialization of the north, it's linked to the, the absence of massive investment in other regions outside the city of London. It's now gobbling up all of London. It's, it's drenched the South Bank with its processes. Uh, uh, it's, it's sort of flowed east and eaten up most of Essex. And if you build a building on Old Street, it's going to be sucked up by the city unless you fight the city. But if you start doing, uh, addressing some of the major problems of London, with the idea that you're going to do, do it through housing in all kinds of places in the city, uh, and then favor the city so that it's, it's, uh, the people there are happy and produce uh, a lot of money, then it's, it's, it's going to hurt. It's, mm -hmm. it's never going to address the problems uh, mm -hmm. of London, which are very severe. There's a lot of uneven development in London that's being uh, overlooked. Brent is, is really, uh, uh, much of it, a, a kind of depressed area economically. And it's also not disconnected from the city. If you, if you have your cellular thinking, then you don't sort of see the systemic relationships on these multiple scales. That you can see uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, poverty emerging in one part of the city, not disconnected. Oh, too bad for them, but we still need, that it may indeed be connected to the very vitality of the city of London. It's a possibility, right? Mm. Uh, that is not seen uh, with uh, more narrow scale thinking. And at the, at the beginning, when you were <clears throat> dealing with the question of definition, uh, you emphasized how um, the question of regionalism had something very specific to do with the idea of placemaking and the question of territoriality and territorial behavior. I wonder whether you could say something about that. Um, the, the relationship between regionalism and territoriality in the context of, for example, some of your own arguments in post-metropolis, whereby one can see, even when you are discussing um, some writings of people like uh, Baudrillard and others, uh, that there is always this, this, this other um, dimension of discussion, which is not necessarily territorial, but maybe it's vectorial in the sense that it's actually dealing with a set of forces that are not specific to a particular territory but are coming, uh, whether it's in terms of organizational structures, in terms of the structure of economy, questions of networks, which somehow are not necessarily um, physical forces, but nevertheless have physical manifestations. Uh, given that this is a kind of condition of postmodernity, isn't somehow your argument about the emphasis now on the territorial, as much as I appreciate it, in the sense of a kind of, uh, a kind of social project as well, doesn't that in some way contradict uh, somehow this, the role of these other forces uh, if you focus so much on the question of the region and the territorial? Uh, the quick answer is yes and no, but it uh, doesn't help. But uh, the, the, my concept of territory is not just this specific form uh, or some kind of rigid notion of territorial space, uh, but indeed this dynamic notion of constantly changing and producing different forms of territorial identity and, and governance uh, at multiple scales mm -hmm. uh, again. Uh, and globalization is indeed part of that process. It's, it's shaping things in, uh, in interesting ways. And it relates to what I, was, I just started to discuss, mm -hmm. which is what, what I would probably have to discuss in much more detail in answer to your question. This notion that over the last 30 years, we've seen a dramatic process of 
territorial, the, the breakdown of multiple scales of territorial mm -hmm. identity, right from the local to the global, and the reconstitution of new forms. Uh, the regional concept, by the way, potentially can apply at all scales, and that's why there is this intimate notion uh, with uh, region. And you could also stretch it with territory, but it's, it's not as easy. You can talk about regions of the brain, and, and there are atlases that map regions of the brain. Mm -hmm. There's this special region that governs, rules over speech, memory, etc. These are micro, <laughs> micro regions, more micro than what architects deal with. Uh, this room space is, is, is a region. We can conceptualize it as a region uh, and look for nodality. And you've got nodality. You're all sitting and facing the central place here. But these are, these are uh, uh, other kinds of issues because the more interesting ones are the ones that are, are, are changing the nature of territorial forms of governance, identity, representation at these multiple scales, right, up to the nation state. Um, but for you, for example, what is the mechanism inherent in regionalism that allows you to then <coughs> deal with a topic like spatial justice? So what is the mechanism that actually gives you sort of value in terms of the, the debates on on spatial justice, <coughs> what can you do? Well, uh, uh, again, the, 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 the multiple uh, examples I gave you, st mm -hmm. starting again with this key notion of scale, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as, as part of this uh, complex spatiality of life, which consists of all of these, placemaking, territorial behavior, regionality and regionalization uh, of, of, of uh, social formation, social life, uh, or uneven development, mm -hmm. uh, cynicism, these are all different aspects of the complex spatiality of life. And yeah, this is, this is where, uh, I mean, I probably have as comprehensive and broad a notion of space and human spatiality as, as almost anyone. Uh, it's, it's a much broader concept than is this common. Uh, and so as a result, all of these are interrelated within the spatiality of human life. Uh, as are networks, I, that's what uh, I know the point you mentioned. But networks are pati of particular interest to me. Uh, I would agree that one of the effects of this deterritorialization and reterritorialization of globalization and economic restructuring is the increasing formation of networks. Right? Uh, and I would see these networks as inherently spatial. Uh, and, but not only spatial, obviously, social, political, economic uh, as well. When I say spatial, that doesn't exclude uh, all of these other aspects, because they're all interwoven. Everything is spatial, just like everything is historical. These networks have an historical, central historical dimension. Nobody blinks an eye. Sometimes to say they have a central spatial dimension, oh, what does that mean? You know, does space really matter? Does it have it? No. It doesn't necessarily mean that history mattered. It's just a way of interpreting what's going on. But however, networks are... I remember my little nasty remark about sociology. Uh, in part, it's related to my response to the notion of networks. Uh, networks are often used to escape from space and spatiality. Uh, a lot of the network... Now, Manuel Castells is, is not part of this because he's French. And, I mean, he's Catalan, but... Uh, he's writing in the French intellectual tradition, which is always much more uh, spatial. Uh, but uh, many sociologists start moving into network theory and act and network. Even geographers are going into this act, act, act and network theory and losing connections with the spatiality of networks. Right. This, this is something I, 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 I criticize. It's somewhat like the old concept of community that developed in urban studies. The notion of community as abstracted from space. We don't use the word neighborhood or, because these are communities of interest. But they are also spatial. And what happens is when you use the word community, which may be fine in its general definition, but it often takes you away from an understanding of the spatial. And so uh, some of the network literature I, I, I am uncomfortable with because of that. But I think the idea of these being uh, a network society being part of what's happening to the organization of space is the other thing. By the way, the other point that I think I wanted to mention from, from your comments is that sometimes, although 
I'm not saying this was your intention. Sometimes these kinds of questions about the space really matter start taking us into this countercurrent. Many of my students uh, from my course are here and they're, they're being asked to write a little article on this topic for their first uh, paper. Uh, and, and that is this notion that new information technologies are leading to the end of geography, the death of distance, location no longer matters, uh, this kind of powerful argument, uh, uh, which sort of sways public opinion very often, leads to academic, famous academic books called The End of Geography, The Borderless World, uh, you know, this, this kind of logical thinking, when the argument could just as well be made and as powerfully be uh, made that the new communications technology is making cities and space and location more important than ever before. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, that's the other uh, uh, part of the current debates, which I find very interesting. I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure I want to make an argument that it's m more important than ever before, but I do that whenever I hear the argument. <laughs> Uh, going in, in no, the other I, direction. I certainly, I certainly wasn't yeah, trying yeah. to uh, infer that, but however, I think, for example, one of the things that you haven't mentioned directly, but it's clearly there, is the status of the political as part of yeah. this question of of, uh, of the region and, uh, in a sense, this discussion of, of spatial justice. So in the context of the United States, when you refer to Los Angeles, I have, I have my own personal experience from a city like Philadelphia, where you just go four blocks north of Center City and you just come across the most incredible and even development that you're, that you're discussing. Yeah. But it seems that if we don't really bring in the dimension of the political directly into the discussion of the region, then we also somehow are discussing the region again only in terms of a set of uh, relationships to do with this wider territory, but still independently of, in fact, its kind of political repercussions. And I thought since United States has been when mentioning the word justice quite a lot in the last kind of couple of months. In a way, it's interesting to find under what circumstances do you, for example, bring justice to a city like, you know, Philadelphia or, or Los Angeles, because just considering the circumstances of relationships doesn't bring about that justice. That justice seems to require, in fact, a certain set of transformations in terms of the political structure, which often actually American cities, for example, are incapable of mm -hmm. making that decision because many of those decisions have to be made at the federal government level. So that's where, when I mention things like the invisible networks, it's actually the invisible forces which might be maybe in some instances much more political. So yeah, the, 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 the lack of uh, material form uh, in many of these processes mm -hmm. Uh, is uh, can be very deceptive. That's that's one of the points that we really need to look at, the, if, as as you described, the in, invisible, uh, I invisible forces. But on the politics of space, I mean, I start uh, with the idea, again, dear Henri Lefebvre's uh, one of his wonderful statements is is all space is inherently political and ideological it literally drips with politics and ideology every pro socially produced space in its form and every spatial uh, every socially produced space in its process of production is inherently a question of power mm. and a question of politics mm. this by the way is another another link to to, to architecture and, and design uh, it's not so much that you have to say, oh my God, if I design it this way, it's going to make people poor. No, no. But just realize that there is power uh, embedded in your design, whether you intend it to be there or not. And this power may affect individuals in, a different, w in different ways. Uh, reinforce the powers of some, uh, reduce the powers of others, or make, make powers more, e it's possible. But you have to realize that there's power embedded to, into, into every space uh, that uh, exists from, from the most local, from that on the page, uh, on the blueprint, uh, to the nature of the global economy. Uh, the political dimension is absolutely central. Maybe, maybe I could just now open the discussion. Um, so, yeah. 
do we have a mic? And could I find out if there is anybody else who wants to ask a question? Okay. Multiple questions inter interlocked. Uh, Frampton, yeah, Frampton uses the term. I had a note down to, to, to talk about Frampton, but uh, because he uses the term regionalism, critical regionalism, but all it means is just reflect local culture and background, uh, it seems, uh, and, and really doesn't get into at all what I'm talking about, or only a little bit in what I'm talking about at regional thinking. Uh, Jameson is, is Jameson to Coolhouse is 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 much more complicated, um, and it has to do with how one interprets the nature of difference. Uh, th there's one angle that's uh, uh, usually left out of the Jameson Coolhouse business, which has to do with the fact that what we move toward, we're moving towards today, given what's been happening, if you want to call it late capitalism or whatever, uh, has been a kind of process of homogenization. Right? Uh, but not just homogenization. We're moving away from responding to inequality with simple equity politics, which uh, a kind of economic equity politics, where we say, uh, as in early forms of feminism, as in early forms of anti-racist struggles, where we say there are unequal levels of economic success and development, and what we want to do is fight and fight and fight to make these more equal. This is a very powerful and important force that I don't want to uh, diminish. Uh, but what's been happening is a shift away from pure equity politics to something which is called the cultural politics of difference. right? which is to say it's not a matter of just erasing these uh, inequalities. It's a matter of uh, achieving justice uh, through s that, that also respects difference. And indeed, it builds off the power of differentiation against forces uh, of homogenization uh, uh, and, and other forces operating, because it's not just uh, homogenization, which often means Americanization, which also gets connected into the literature that uh, uh, that Jameson writes about, and, and to some extent, Kuhlhaus. Um, and so, uh, yes, there is a threat, as there is with, and we, we've talked about it before, with everything spatial, which means everything, with any social process, with any politics, uh, that it can move uh, towards uh, a, a regressive and an emancipatory uh, size. Right? There's no doubt about it. Uh, space can trap and close for, force domination, inequality, exploitation, or it can be a place where, where one sort of struggles successfully against it. 
uh, these, this is the core of the political question, the power question. So yes, sometimes differences commodify. Um, uh, David Harvey has a new piece on, on what is it, urban uh, absolute rent? Larry, what's, Sorry. what's, what's the rent uh, the, uh, the ap that you wrote about? Is it a absolute monopoly rent, absolute rent? Right. And, and <coughs> yes, fine. And, and so th there's an argument of, uh, from, from sort of Marxist rent theory that, that uh, emerges about this commodification process, the commodification of location and locational differences and spatial differences and so on, uh, is increasingly commodified, uh, threatened to be commodified because of, as you say, Processes such as uh, Disneyfication or uh, the what uh, a conference I went to uh, for the Graz Biennale uh, Biennial of Architecture and, and Media, they called it uh, the using borrowing from Disney the imagined urban condition. Uh, that this this is a very interesting process, uh, and so what it's showing, by the way, is not just that difference and differentiation can foster capitalism or whatever you will or increase negative impacts uh, but that homogenization <coughs> is not as clear a process uh, as uh, it was or as people often consider it to be that what's happening in the world today is not some sort of battle between another binary another modernist binary if you want homogenization versus what had terrorization uh, making differentiation right? Uh, that that was an old model in Marx, in all forms of modernism, liberal modern, whatever we talk about it. Jameson, too, despite his postmodernism, flips back to uh, classical modernist binaries as well in his work. That that uh, uh, that this is not a, a simple process of homogenization versus differentiation. These, are like, by the way, this is very related to things like public space versus private. It's not as simple as that anymore. We're finding m a much greater complexity I in these processes than uh, had been there in the past. Uh, and we need to know them in a different way. But yes, there are the dangers uh, are always there. Um, perhaps you could comment on how you understand um, the idea of thresholds into regions, um, how thresholds are defined um, in relation to regions. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by threshold. Um, well, kind of in my, my mind's eye from when you're talking, I have an idea of regions being defined as uh, <coughs> areas, not necessarily geographical, but areas that have multiple nodes and seem to have some sort of um, peripheral condition. And so what is the point at which you start to enter beyond or into through the periphery, into that region, and not simply <coughs> through the idea of networks that seems to um, all encompass it. Yeah, yeah I, I know it's a question that I, I, I don't think I have an easy answer to. I mean, it, 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 it's related to, uh, again, the, the point is that that boundary or that threshold is, is exactly what's changing. All forms of uh, territorial boundedness and boundaries have been uh, changing and shifting. So what we have seen, uh, for example, in one threshold, uh, we have seen a, a, sh a, a major change in what we've defined as metropolitan region. That the concept of the modern metropolis was a very clearly defined one, which had to do with if you want to call it a threshold or, or a boundary change, which we always thought we could identify, between what is urban and what is suburb. The, the modern metropolis was a neat, dualized world. There was urbanism as a way of life, excitement, density, creativity, newness, uh, etc., cetera, uh, heterogeneity. And then there was suburbanism, homogeneous, bland, uh, open spaces, garden communities, boring, 
uh, but <laughs> clean, etc. Uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, clear boundedness is exactly what's uh, changing today. Uh, there's an urbanization of the suburbs, there's a suburbanization of the central city. Uh, some cities are emptying out, some are being third worldized with huge populations like Los Angeles coming into the center. The one major thing I'm saying is that all of our old boundary lines and thresholds that we have learned from the textbooks and learned from our uh, teachers uh, about the modern metropolis have very significantly changed. Los Angeles, well, maybe London too, is, 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 is ex expresses this vividly right? uh, in that uh, is Watts or the South Central Los Angeles, this center of poverty, is this urban? Or is this personification of the inner city? It sort of looks suburban. Uh, nice little houses with little gardens in the front. And what is this? And then you go out uh, to what were suburbs, and you know they're as urbanized as anywhere else uh, in terms of density, job concentration, more jobs than beds. Wow, in the suburbs? What does this do to our definition of the city? It's really screwy. Uh, and hence, this is the core of what I'm, I'm arguing in the book about what I call the post-metropolitan transition. We've gone well beyond. If all the thresholds of the modern metropolis, in this case, or the metropolitan region, into something that's much more complex, as you say, uh, multi-centered, you know, we're mega cities, uh, we, we now have regional cities. Uh, we have Shanghai and, and Pearl River Delta, 55 million people, greater, I mean, southern Hanshu, 55, 60 million people cities, conglomerate cities, regional cities, massive conurbations. All of these terms are now coming back into the, the conurbation, coming back into the literature, but the concept of regional cities. Uh, you know, even Castells doesn't do networks. He talks about these massive uh, regional cities uh, uh, as part of uh, what's been happening over the last thing. But Ed, if, if this, um, let's call it definition of cities and ci particularly city edges, yeah. is so much in transformation, uh, looking at London, would you say that the mayor's decision to block London, not allow any development outside what is conceived as being the edge, conceived as being the edge, is therefore something which is retrograde and that in fact the region of London which extends probably in a banana shape up towards Cambridge, say, in terms of a regional economy, is in fact something that should be densified in what is suburban or even green, greenfield land. I mean, are those notions of contemporary planning, which are still part of the vocabulary of, of uh, power, uh, valid anymore? Um, I, the quick answer, for, again, for that one is, is, is uh, unfortunately no. Mm. Uh, that, uh, but rather than specifically focusing upon the plan about the uh, controlling uh, entry into the central city, uh, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I don't think it's, it, it would make a great difference if the boundaries of what were considered that zone of the central city were uh, changed, increased, or decreased very much. Uh, but I'd rather switch to the other side, that the whole regional structure of the Greater London uh, association of the GLA is, uh, is uh, maybe the problem in itself, that Livingston never raised the problem, the issue of new regional thinking. And that yes indeed, as uh, I remember one of your visuals from Tony Travers, uh, I, I think, uh, showed that there are multiple, much larger definitions of the greater London region. Mm. Uh, that uh, from a regionalist point of view were probably going to be much better. Uh, uh, than this present region. Uh, it would also open up uh, the fact that uh, one of the ways of dealing with the problems of central London, and they are massive, uh, and they are partly caused by that dreadful woman who one of her first acts was to attack all forms of regional planning in Britain and to destroy any form of spatial planning because she saw this uh, as politically uh, uh, incorrect mm. and challenging. And so London has suffered from, from uh, this terrible deterioration of any kind of sense of spatial planning. 
Uh, with, uh, if there was anything, it was a kind of devilish thing by the transportation plan to say, well, one way of preserving the wonders of central London mm. is to not help the automobile and, and cause as much chaos mm. as possible. <laughs> right? uh, and I think they've been proven wrong because that chaos is now really dangerous. It's threatening lives, it's creating massive problems for the, for the rest of London. So I think some sort of way uh, to, 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 to shape things better uh, in central London it, it is a, a, an important priority. But connected to it might be the idea of genuinely recognizing alternative major centers. If you're obsessed with that damn one mile called the city, one square mile, if this is, is your vision of what you want to preserve above all else, then the, that rationale for the policy is all wrong, right? Uh, so, so it's a difficult. I mean, I can't ask. I mean, I'm answering the question, but uh, it's, it doesn't have to do with the, the boundaries uh, that Livingston is, uh, is suggesting. It has to do with everything else about the multi-scale nature again of what's happening in London. Uh, the contextualization of that issue uh, is what uh, is at stake here, we, and, and what needs to be rethought that that contextualization does, uh, could include dynamics that should involve Reading and Cambridge and Oxford uh, and Brighton uh, uh, and the channel and Dover and the Channel Crossing and so on uh, as part of a substantial larger region uh, of Southeast England that, that uh, London is the dominant uh, core of. But we're seeing uh, multiple centers of substantial importance economically and culturally and politically also arising. Hugo, did you? Well, Rick has already pushed in a direction that I wanted to just go a bit further, which is this question of, of the, sort of the scales of which you can really deal with these things, uh, in particularly in, in relation to London. Uh, and it seems there are, there are really great difficulties. As you said, that, that woman created this extraordinary situation where we actually remove any possibility thinking, and London went through this very bizarre period, is now sort of reinvented a scale of thinking, which in, in some ways is even smaller yes. than the old LCC, mm, yeah. GLC, GLC scale, yeah. which seems tremendously disappointing. On the other hand, if we, if we extend your ideas to the other extreme, there seem to be fundamental problems of governance yes. and yes. structure and decision making yes. on one side, and fund fundamental problems of the imaginative capacity yeah. of architects and designers on the other side to deal with a bigger scale. Uh, so it's a question, uh, lots of people have been touching on this, what, where can one begin to set interesting sort of yes. edges between certain sorts of nodes within your nested scale, yeah. which will allow us to start to operate some things, rather than simply, I mean, it's very seductive, this, yeah. this, this bigger, ever bigger, yeah. <laughs> We've got to find some ways that we can we can get at some bits without excluding mm. the interchange up and down the right. scales, but being able to operate. And uh, that's one very specific question. Is the spatial development strategy one possible tool, you think, to start at least at that scale, or is it already flawed? It's already deeply criticized as being far too central, far too obsessed with you know, problems yeah. at the center, not for the yeah. outside, and so on. It hasn't, even, yeah. it hasn't even been published yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but the spatial development strategy is not allowed by law exactly. to yes. actually look at specific projects. Yeah. Small point. Yes, I, I was going to start with the mm. last point uh, about the spatial development strategy. Yes, indeed. I, 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 want, I, I think every possible opportunity, no matter how thin and frail it may be, should be cultivated. I'm very interested in the spatial development policy and I don't want uh, the strategy and I don't want to engage in uh, a, another kind of tactic which is so typical I see in Britain which is just to, to pile on the negatives, to see all of the problems without looking at, at some alternatives here, with, without some kind of flexibility in your thought that it's not just a matter, let's find all the things wrong with it and laugh at it and, and so on. I think it's absolutely, you know, but it's, 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 an, it's not just a happenstantial uh, opportunity. It is something that in some little way 
has a funny little connection to the new consciousness on the continent. Right? And there may possibly be a little grain there, a little ember that we could you know, do something with. I, I, I would agree that we don't need to do that. On, uh, we don't need to sort of just uh, negate this particular example. In fact, I, I bring it up because it is, I think, it, it is got that word. It's got some explicit stuff in there. Uh, although it's not, people may not be conscious of it. But the other part of the question is also vital and, and, and I, I, I didn't make it clear, and it really needs to be clarified. Uh, and that has to do with uh, the institutional formality of regional governance. Right? I think, the, as you, you suggest yourself, that the scale of the uh, GLA uh, is inappropriate. Right? Uh, I would also argue, and I think you would agree, that it needs to be uh, seen on a larger scale. But the actual achievement of this larger scale has to also be seen in many more flexible ways than we used to think of. All right? It's not a matter of taking a one-shot jump to say, okay, now we're, we're going to call the Greater London Authority this huge boundary mm -hmm. and institutionalize it that way. That's not the only choice. There's another, cho one, one of the other choices is that the uh, Greater London Authority as it exists now operates as a unit that can cooperate with a series of similar units uh, in the outer city and, and, and in the area surrounding it and, and just be a kind of, uh, of cooperation. Even if it's, by the way, not a totally institutionalized cooperation. It could be a, a, a flexible and specialized cooperation. We cooperate only on transit and environment. Okay, that's a start at least. Uh, will we cooperate in terms of industrial location and a kind of regional uh, industrial council, shared technology and so on? Well, maybe, but maybe not right away. That's a possibility. And the other thing is indeed related to this, and that is that we, the new regional governance, and, and, and there are a few examples, not many, uh, uh, of a, a new kind of regional governance. I mean, this again is not a matter of flipping back to regional thinking of 30 years ago, because that's outdated. The old movement for metropolitan regions uh, is, now, is not appropriate uh, for the present. We need new, new concepts, and this relates also to the fact that we can have informal organizations. By the way, this is the great challenge that I'm facing with Catalonia, because I'm not saying let's just raise this onto the whole level of Catalonia, but the argument is to try to find flexible forms of regional governments that can adapt more effectively to, the, to these great regional challenges uh, of uh, inequalities and increasing poverty, but also competitiveness in a global economy where we can have regional cooperation rather than intra-regional competition and fighting. Uh, you know, that, that kind of thing may, may require very different forms of, of uh, governance than, than we're familiar with. But it's a very important point in, in, in this argument. Would anyone like to ask the last question? Brian, would you go for it? Can we get the microphone and then I'll go back to Ricky. It's on, just speak to it. In, in um, relating region to power, um, the question arises whether you can have a region without power. And in relation to your observations about the relative weakness of regional uh, discourse in Britain, it seems to me that a very simple explanation is that once you move outside of London, there's no power. It's very difficult to identify regions. Um, there was once a, a distinct uh, nomination in the hierarchy of naming places. Um, there was the capital, and there was a thing called provincial city. There was province. And the term province has disappeared off the sort of uh, radar screen. Really. No one would use this word anymore. Although, in fact, the way the word region gets used in this country tends to denote province. It, it simply occupies that semantic slot. At the same time, the distinct role of provincial cities seems to have disappeared. There are no regional companies, companies with national headquarters 
within regional cities tend to be uh, sort of fewer and fewer. And it seems to me that uh, it becomes very difficult then to identify the units of, uh, of power that would, would denote the region uh, in any other place than the capital city. Well, I, I, um, I, I define things perhaps differently, but uh, I, I don't see any space. Uh, that has no power. It, it, it's that's any occupied space that doesn't have power. Uh, it, it, this doesn't necessarily mean formal institutionalized state power or uh, administrative power, uh, or even uh, I don't know economic power. I guess, but economic <laughs> power certainly. Uh, you can see this elsewhere. And indeed, globalization has been reducing, uh, producing some of the kinds of things you are describing. Uh, but there is a, 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 a significant, uh, go, going away from the power issue, because I think power is always related there. And it's not that power exists in London. What uh, exists in London is power over other spaces. Uh, and the power over uh, other spaces varies from place to place, whether we call them provincial cities or not. That, um, that I don't think is much the issue. But certainly the, the devolution process, the rise of Scotland is a, is a form of regionalism. Uh, the, the, the election, the referendum in Wales is, is a significant form of regionalism. Uh, there's a, a restoration of what are called regional assemblies. A lot of people say, ah, well, there's nothing much there. But nevertheless, there are new regional assemblies forming elsewhere. There is actually uh, questions uh, rising in the paper. Yorkshire is next. Yorkshire is soon going to demand a certain regional assembly, regional coordination, regional governance. Uh, as the, f the beginning of a new regionalism uh, movement in, in Britain. Oh, whether it happens, I don't know. Uh, there's, uh, the GLA was supposed to uh, expand into Sheffield and other major metropolitan areas to form uh, major metropolitan regional uh, uh, forms of, of weak government, at least, uh, as it is in, 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 in London. Uh, all of these are, are indicative of the fact that regions are incredibly alive, that uh, there is constant competition over space, knowledge, and power going on between regions always, uh, and within regions always, between various portions of the regions, and that a lot of this is in flux and being redefined. Uh, but in this redefinition, what does seem to be emerging are, are interesting new ideas. Now, I think what happened in the Greater London, uh, Greater London Authority and the election, uh, as I'm sure you all know, that there was, uh, uh, there was a kind of short-circuiting of the devolution process that occurred because of local politics uh, within the Labour Party uh, uh, over the mayoral uh, uh, election. And what this did was to force Livingston to be obsessive about re-election because he's constantly fighting the great power source at the center uh, uh, in competition. And, you know, the, the, the short answer to questions about whether they should think spatially or think regionally is, as my advisors say, it's not politically particularly interesting at the moment. Uh, that, the, 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 uh, that London, uh, what, what's happening in London is uh, a kind of competition between, uh, uh, if you want, I guess, central government, parliament, and, and the Greater London Authority and, and Livingston uh, over who, who controls symbolically, economically, and in other ways, uh, uh, London. Uh, and that, they don't care about regions. Uh, what they really care about is the city. Uh, the city again. Yeah. So uh, I, I disagree with the fundamental point about uh, no power out there. Every, every space has power. Uh, every, 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 every area of the world has, uh, uh, expresses power in all kinds of ways. Uh, to isolate it into a, uh, a general picture fixed at one scale, which I'm afraid I think it sounded as if you were doing, uh, is exactly the opposite of the kind of interscalar thinking from the local upward that I've, I've been talking about. Well, what I'm, I, I'm really thinking of is the city where effectively everybody's an employee. And therefore, the historic thinker said about the historical world, it seems to be very difficult to see. 
I just, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand what every city, uh, every dweller in the city is an employee. I don't know what that means. Because they, they would have no executive role. Who would have an executive? I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm not sure I understand. I, I just don't understand the, the direction that it's going. Uh, who, who won't have an executive role? Well, the city could not formulate itself as a city. It would be merely a large conglomeration, as it were, of employees. Therefore, it could not constitute itself the region, because it would have no ability to control it, its, its, its uh, destiny. I, 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 I'm sorry. Maybe we can go to, we can continue that conversation yeah. afterwards. Uh, Ricky, did you want to? I, I don't want to lower the tone of the conversation, but I feel a bit like your student at Harvard, or the students <laughs> at Harvard, who, who actually yeah, want to get something out of you so that we can you invite use it. I did. I, I was responsible but, for inviting you. <laughs> but, but in a way, that question is, is very much at the back of, of, of my mind, and I think all of us who are sort of involved in... I mean, you've taught me, you've taught us to think different scales. Yeah. The question still remains when you've got a blank piece of paper in the middle of Greenwich. What the hell do you do there? And what interests me is that the more I hear you and others talk about uh, you know, the importance of the, the, the meta scale and, and uh, the forces that shape city and regional development, and the more I look at those cities which are actually incredibly exciting, I mean, Barcelona, you've already talked about part of the Randstad and Amsterdam in particular, the more these issues, I think, are considered, and London is certainly not uh, within that framework, oddly, it seems to me, I may be wrong, Ed, but it seems to me that what they're doing is focusing in on projects. Uh, Oriol Bohigas, um, who may be slightly out of date, but after all was probably responsible for one of the most successful turnarounds mm -hmm. of a city policy, basically says the last thing you do is you plan cities. Right? Now, I know you don't say that, Ed. But what he says, the only way you can make cities work within this sort of flexible framework which recognizes the regional forces or global forces is by actually focusing down on a scale and taking maybe five sites. I mean, a slight exaggeration, but not that, that much. I mean, the famous public space interventions of the 80s and 90s. At the moment there, Barcelona, as you know, focusing on saying, okay, let's throw five balls up in the air one is a sort of forum complex on the east of the city and all that. He's done the same in a city like Salerno, where basically there's no plan, it's just a series of projects. Do you find that interesting? And how do we use the regional approach to inform the decisions that we make as designers? Well, you, you picked two, two cities that, uh, and, and interpreted one of them differently uh, from what I would. <laughs> Uh, I think the planning that Bohigas talks about is not the planning I talk about, right? Uh, and that uh, these traditional forms, uh, that's, that was my, my little attack on the whole concept of town, because mm. town planning is, you know, uh, well, I can understand uh, uh, its, uh, its evilness. Nor is planning uh, uh, the production of master plans, right? And these were the targets. When Bohigas used planning, uh, he, he meant that. No. Right? Uh, in terms of the kind of regional vision, uh, I think, and particularly I'm, I'm seeing it visibly, not from Bohigas, but from Asabio, no. which is telling me that there was a regional thinker mm. behind the core of the major achievements of uh, Barcelona. Mm -hmm. right? Now, Amsterdam to me is entirely different. Amsterdam, from the in, throughout the entire post-war period and before, was the most thickly planned. Uh, everything in, in, in mm -hmm. Amsterdam was planned, but with brilliant uh, anarchy uh, and flexibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, and tolerance in its, every, every rigidity had its other side of openness and tolerance. Mm -hmm. Every closure was, was uh, uh, thoughtfully balanced. And uh, there was uh, uh, a, a small scale metropolitan regional mentality always shaping this. And, and uh, uh, 
things got more competitive in the Randstadt, but the, even in the Randstadt there was a kind of coordination. What is the heart of the Randstadt? Uh, the, the, the green heart. Mm. Uh, where, and by the way, it's also polluted like Los Angeles, as I once said, but mainly from the, the farts of cows, I think, than, than uh, from the automobile. But that's another story. But Amsterdam is a brilliant example of a, of a, a, a democratically mm. uh, planned city and mm. city region, metropolitan region, region in this case. Now it being, it's being threatened now, mm. but it, uh, the Dutch are adapting, and they, they, they have been the most spatial regional thinkers mm. in Europe, by the way. Mm. Every, I mean, unfortunately, uh, not unfortunately, but some of the experiments were, were dreadful. Uh, Lelystad and some of the, uh, I mean, using, they used this crystal as central place theory as a, a, a rigid plan in parts of it, mm. and they had to loosen it up, and they did. Uh, but the planning is, uh, planning is happening brilliantly. I mean, the, the major plans for the Oysterdach, uh, when, when they first arose, uh, weren't resisted by the left in the government of, of uh, uh, Amsterdam, uh, the responsibility for planning review in the city council of Amsterdam was given to the radical green member mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. council. Uh, and the intent there was not to stop the redevelopment, the Canary Wharf, the, what could have been a Canary Wharf equivalent mm -hmm. uh, in the worst sense, uh, but to humanize that process of, of yuppie development. Of course, they accepted the yuppie development, but they produced one of the finest, uh, in an architectural sense uh, and design sense, one of the finest kinds of new uh, uh, housing for global brokers uh, uh, in any major world city. And yes, the issue of projects can still happen as long as the project are defined with a sufficiently macro scale mm. and don't just happen and pop mm. out because of opportunistic things or, or because of property forces exclusively no. or through general forces of globalization or else your projects are going to be high rises in the city. Uh, so I think in, in Barcelona the great achievement in architecture that it won the prizes for mm. uh, is it indeed I think attached to a uh, a regional division. Okay. This uh, regional imagination and, a re and regional thinking, this is one of the classic areas of regionalism on earth. <laughs> uh, you are claiming that those projects are contextualized in your in in the the Yeah, uh, not as rich as I would want them, and I think they are being now. Uh, but I think in the past those projects were indeed within this larger context in which Catalonia was seen versus Madrid, Mm -hmm. uh, and that competitiveness was to, to, to sort of contextualize within the specificity of the geography, if you want, of Catalonia, also affected the, uh, the project. Barcelona's, even the 19th century plans of Barcelona, uh, had a larger kind of regional vision. Uh, uh, and so, uh, no, no, sir, no. that's very interesting. I mean, of course, of the, I forget the names, but these two industrial cities to the north, uh, are, are really now sort of major uh, important cities in themselves and they're now having to develop special so there's a lot of interesting things happening. Very good, well this is a good moment to stop. I, I, I think it's wonderful that uh, after all these years if you haven't lost any of your <laughs> passion <laughs> and uh, I think we've learned a lot about the question of regions. In, in fact I think that uh, it's been particularly out in the context of, of what I was telling you earlier with this uh, landscape urbanism mm -hmm. program that we have, which in many respects I think is also trying to bring many of these issues uh, of the region and the, the larger territory in tension with both questions of urbanism and, and architecture. And I'd like to thank Ricky uh, for being here tonight and for your comments and all of you. Uh, thank you and see you hopefully on Friday when we have Michael Craig Martin. Thank you. Thank you.